When I personally think about what what really brought us here as parents, I think what really brought all of us together is that I think an innocence has been robbed from us. I believe that as a Jewish community, nobody ever believed that this could happen. And as parents, I think we've moved into a mode of discomfort and fear that I think we have never believed we could go to. And so I think that our our innocence has, has been totally robbed from us. I know that a friend of mine told me recently, she said that the night after the child was missing, after Libby was missing, there was a big Tehillim gathering. And she said, I went and I said to Tehillim, and I said it with everybody else, but none of us had any idea we were saying to Tehillim for something like this. Can you imagine how the room would have shaken had we had any idea? We all said to Tehillim that he would be brought back faster. That he was in some, it never entered our minds that this could be a possibility. And I believe that that is true, that it, has, it would never enter our minds that this be a possibility in our world. And I think that that's where we are today. Today we're at a place where I'm going to tell you I've probably given 50 or 60 or 70 parent workshops on child safety. And I spend 20 to 25 minutes on this slide. Can this happen in our community? Can children be abused? Can children be taken? Can children, and I give story after story and people look at me with blank stares. It's nice, it'll never happen. And I don't believe that I'm there tonight. I believe that what I really need to look at tonight is the next piece, which is the earthquake is not the disaster. It's not having a plan that's a disaster. And as the chaplain said who came to us from New York, that we have to look at how to learn from a crisis. Um, and what my goal is tonight is to take the 25 or 30 minutes that I have allotted and to make sure that you walk out with an awareness of different issues, prevention skills to a degree, and I'm going to go through why I'm going to say to a degree, and third is the knowledge that there is so much more that needs to be learned in order to create safety for our children. Um, I usually give a two-hour workshop and feel that I'm just touching the surface on every area, tonight we're doing it in 25 minutes. So we're going to go very quickly, and my hope is that at the end you know what they, the Rashe Prakim are, and that you can take these issues and, and go home and work with your spouses on fleshing them out at home for your family and creating a plan. Where is it that our kids need to be protected? Our kids need to be protected everywhere. They need to be protected in school, on a school bus, in shul, in camp, in sports leagues, on the net. That's scary for us. That means they need to be protected everywhere. And in every one of these areas, we have to be talking to our children. I'm, 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 guessing that if I were to ask you how many of you have actually sat down and discussed each of these areas with your children and safety in each of them, there are areas that probably have not been discussed. So let's take a look at how we can, how we can flesh out conversations and concerns and awareness in each of these areas. The other thing I just want to make you aware of is not only where could there be problems, but who. And abusers can be anybody. That's the bottom line. They can be family members. Um, they can be uh, friends or neighbors. They can be someone who has access to a child, like a teacher or a coach or a youth leader, youth leaders in, in, in shuls or in other places that we, we have our children go. They can be religious leaders. Um, they can be caregivers or babysitters. And as hard as it is to honestly say, I can tell you that I could tell you um, specific stories about every single one of them that have happened in our community. So what we need to look at is that it's, it's our job to make sure that our children are protected. And we have to know what every area is 
where they are vulnerable. And abusers, abusers have the ability to often identify vulnerable children and families, and then they gain access and trust within those families. So it's very, very important that we really be aware of all the areas and of who, can, who could possibly abuse our children. What we're going to do right now, I'm, I'm going to take a look with you at what the areas are when I give a talk that are the four areas that parents request more and more information on. These are what I'm calling the more broad stroke areas that parents whenever we give the longer talk are asking for more and more information. They are extremely concerned about these issues. After this I'm going to go into what we call the ABCs of safety which are general rules about your children and safety. So we're going to start with grooming, we're going to talk about supervision at home, babysitting and camp safety. We're going to then go in a little bit to the recognizing of warning signs that, that a child might show and how to handle a disclosure. Again, we're going very quickly, bringing up just the highlights, and my hope is that there will be more workshops available in TNEC and you'll get more information on each of them. Grooming is something very, very important. It's the process, the, the grooming process is specifically designed to lull the child into a sense of ease, thus blurring any aware, awareness of improper adult behavior. So the first thing that parents will ask is, are there signs that, that someone may be abusive or that someone may want to develop that special relationship with, that, with our child? And here's some of what we want to look at. We want to look at that these are the adults who are spending a lot of time with children. I, I would say that I've never been to a city, and I've been to many, where a shul rabbi has not stopped me and said, there is this man who is spending a tremendous amount of time in our children's programs or in the, in the kiddish room with children. I, I think really almost in every shul that I've been to. Those are people that we have to have brought to the awareness that a shul has to put limits on. People who act like the child's parents and develop a strong bond with them. They become over-friendly. Um, they will buy them gifts uh, and have a very cl a closer relationship that would be normative in, in, in that person's role. So if a coach is a coach of a basketball league, then they would do that. But they would not necessarily take, need to take that child out afterwards and spend all this extra time with them. It's the extra relationship and the extra grooming that you want to be careful of. The other piece that's important is that within grooming, often the relationship is built on secrets. So I think that those are all very important. It's that extra attention that, and um, the other piece is physical, physical touching, rubbing, kissing. We just got a call, I just got a call from Israel, a family, a young couple in Israel had a chesed girl. And the chesed girl was um, touching their son, a, a five or six year old, a lot. Um, and they asked her to stop. They said they were not comfortable, and what they saw after a while was she could not stop. Now, we don't know that she actually did or didn't do anything fully inappropriate because these parents recognized grooming, and they were able to stop the relationship very quickly. But they recognized that she kept developing this relationship, and she couldn't stop even when they called it to their attention. So. Be, what, what am I telling you as parents? Be aware of those special relationships. Ask questions about your child's where, whereabouts and remain involved in all the adult child relationships in your life, in their lives. You need to be involved. You need to be a part of that. Um, create a safe environment for your child so that they can share with you any time that they are uncomfortable um, with anybody and that they will know that you believe them and you trust them. So you need to have that relationship with them. The other piece that's important is that anytime someone tells them a secret 
or tells them that any part of the relationship is a secret and not to tell their parents is an automatic they need to come and tell you. And as parents, nobody should be having secrets bet between them and your child from you. So that's an automatic area of concern for you. Um, in terms of grooming, teach your children never to accept gifts from adults or older children without talking to you first. You need to be involved in that. Even the candy man in Shoal, you need to know what's happening. Children need to be raised that they don't accept gifts unless you know about it. They can be okayed by their father that it's fine to get that and then go get it. But they need to start from a very young age knowing that accepting gifts is something you don't do without parental permission. Safe touch needs to apply to all adults in their lives. And you need to, to share that with them and we're going to talk more about that later. This is something that I believe in very strongly and I talk about a lot. Adults need to play with adults and children need to play with children. Adults shouldn't be playing with children. That means that that adult who is always in the children, the children section or spending a lot, a lot of time with children, I don't know if there's anything wrong, but it's definitely pink flag. And your child needs to be playing with children. So keep your child understanding that children play with children and that they should never be told to keep secrets from you. Okay. This is a sensitive area in our community and I'm going to talk about it because I think it's important. We call it supervision at home, but in essence we're really talking about incest. And um, several years ago in 2009 I gave uh, a um, workshop on um, working with the Orthodox Jewish community to a juvenile sex crimes unit and what they told me was that the highest rate of incest that they had was in the Orthodox community. They were very concerned. As of recently, there was a Nefesh conference of Orthodox Jewish therapists and rabbis in, um, in the five towns, and David Pelkowitz asked the question, how many therapists here have dealt with a case of incest? And 75% of the therapists raised their hands. So what I'm going to say is this is something that we need to be aware of. Um, up to one-third of sex offenses against children occur at the hands of other youth and peers. And the rate of sibling incest, brother to, sis brother to sister, is estimated to be five times higher than parent incest. So what am I saying to you? What, what do you need to know? Supervise, supervise, supervise. Keep your children supervised. Pay attention to behavioral and physical indicators that something wrong is happening and develop a trusting relationship with your, with your children. It's, you know, recently we had a situation that came to us of a, of a mother who um, the daughter actually told her sister that the brother had touched her and, and said what happened, told the whole story. The six, sister actually came to the mother and said this is what happened. And the family actually talked about the whole thing. Um, thank God in that situation it was not a terrible offense. Um, but what ended up happening was the whole family went on a different, um, a different system within the house. In other words, as of then, nobody was allowed to play with closed doors. All doors were open. There's playtime, but doors had to remain open. The parents made sure that they did what they called spot checks, or the concept of yotze v'nichnas. We parents need to get up and check. I always say that, you know, you can have a family get together, a Shabbos lunch. You have all your family members, right? So you have the beginning of the meal before before motzi. You have, you know, 25 seats set, right? And then everybody sits down, and the minute that challah enters your mouth, you've got. 18 kids that take off, right? And you've got the six adults left or seven adults left, right? Isn't that what happens in your houses? How many times do people get up and go check on the kids? Never. You're saying never. It doesn't have to be that you're looking because you feel something terrible's happening. 
it can be just a natural thing that you get up and you go check on your children and you check on the other children that are there. Whether it's small bullying things that are happening, someone being left out of a game, children playing doctor, or anything else. The issue is children should know their parents are coming and going. Um, really, this is what I'm saying, which is, uh, in addition, the last thing I just want to say about this is create safe family rules around the concept of bathing and dressing times. From a very young age, there's not a reason not to say um, the girls are going to dress in this room and the boys are going to dress in that room. Um, and to respect when your children ask that, that someone not come in, that, that a brother not come in when they're dressing. Not to say, please, he's just your brother. But if a little girl has that sensitivity, respect it. In fact, promote it. That they should have their privacy around the private areas of their bottom, of their, <laughs> of their body. Um, okay, babysitting. I want to move on to the issue of babysitting. This is an issue we get a tremendous amount of concern about, is the hiring of babysitting, babysitters and setting up standards with babysitters. You leave your children in the hand of a young girl in most cases. So one of the things we talk about is ask for recommendations. In general, when I ask how many people have ever called and asked for recommendations, the only recommendation you really get is, are they available? Right? That's not enough. Find out more about them. Um, be clear with the babysitter, because what we hear from babysitters is, parents say, see you later, we'll be back at 10, and they leave. And they, babysitters really don't know what you want from them. Um, they don't know if they're supposed to do homework with them, put them to bed at a certain time. They don't know what the rules are. Um, they don't know what your expectations are. So be clear with your babysitters about what you exactly what you want from them. Check in with your children when you leave. It's fine to call your ch children and find out how they are if it's a new babysitter that you don't have a relationship with. And definitely when they leave, ask your children how it was. I, I will tell you a personal story that I've told before, which is that we used to tell our children that if anybody ever tells you a secret or to do, don't tell mommy and daddy that you immediately have to tell your parents. Well, one day we had to, one night we had to go out and we hired a babysitter that we knew. And the next morning, the kids told us that we, they were waiting because the babysitter was coming with donuts. And we asked why was the babysitter bringing donuts? Because if we didn't tell you the secret, then we were going to get donuts. And we asked, well, what was the secret? And the babysitter had gone into the bathroom and she had taken a bath in our bathtub and put on my husband's robe. And she didn't do anything else, but you know what? That's enough for me, <laughs> right? But you know what? There was a rule the kids knew. If someone says, don't tell mommy and daddy, it was a natural, then you tell. So you have to set that, those kinds of things up in advance and really just make sure you are comfortable with the babysitter and that you're checking. Check in with the babysitter also. See what you feel about what, what, about what the babysitter says about your own children. Does it feel like they're talking in a way that they're respecting your children? I want to talk about camp safety also. Um, let me go very quickly now. I think that most children are already in camp and what I just want to say is Really, we have to teach kids a lot about the personal safety in reference to their body before they go to camp. Um, again, this is an area there's a tremendous amount to be learned about in terms of conversations with kids before camp. But one of the things that's important is talking about changing times um, and dressing times. There's a lot of changing bathing suits, bed, all that kind of stuff, about sleeping in their own bed and not sleeping with others. Um, and also, any experiences you may have had in camp may be important to share with them so that you can give them an idea about how to cope with things. Um, I am, I'm going to go really quickly here. Um, how do you know if something's happened to your child? Really quickly, you might see new fears, fear of strangers, or even fear of somebody they know. 
when they're saying, I don't like it when Uncle Maishi comes to the house. I just don't like it. I don't want to kiss him. I don't want to. Those are things that might be pink flags for you or red flags for you. Eating problems or changing patterns with girls, especially anorexia or bulimia, bedwetting, sleep difficulties, this avoiding of certain people or certain situations, um, either extreme modesty, the girls who are wearing layer after layer after layer covering themselves up, or girls who are turning to very promiscuous behavior at a young age. Um, and then it could be just physical symptoms, headaches, abdominal pains, all those kinds of things. Those could be many things, but they also could be warning signs to ask questions about if anybody has been inappropriate with them. Why don't kids tell? Could be the abuser told them it was a secret. The abuser may have threatened to harm them or harm their family member. I will kill your parent if you do that. We had a child who was severely molested that we saw and um, the, 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 the abuser actually was put into prison, but the child didn't understand that concept. And every night he spent walking from room to room all night long in his house making sure that everybody was okay because he was threatened that if he ever told they would come back and kill his parents. So he was protecting them all night long by going from room to room to make sure that he couldn't come get them. Um, they may have fear of the abuser, they may love or respect the abuser, they may be ashamed, but most important is that they really don't believe that you're going to believe them. So this is something that's incredibly important to make sure that your child knows that no matter what, that you will believe them. Um, really um, quickly, what would you do if your child did tell you that something happened to them? Um, one, make sure they're safe from that abuser. Find a private place to talk. Remain very, very calm and reassuring. And I'm going to say to keep them um, to keep them informed of anything that you need to do. Um, I'm going through this very quickly because of time, but there's a tremendous amount more on each of these areas. And then lastly, what I want to do is I want to talk about this, and, and I'm going to do this rather quickly as well, but I want to talk about what we have developed, what we call the Elenu Safety Kid um, program. And this program goes to schools where we work with children and we work with the administration and we work with teachers and we also work with parents. We do all of that within the program. But what we teach the children as well as the parents are the ABCDs of safety. And that's what I want to very quickly go through because they are very tight um, rules that are very important. The A is ask for help. And these, what we're teaching our children is to ask for help, to um, let, one of the most important things here is, is to identify who is a safe helper. What we teach children is that it's an officer, it is a cashier, or someone working there, and most importantly it is a mother with children. And that if they are ever lost or need help, that those are their safe helpers. We teach them that if they get separated from their parents, they need to what we call hug a tree. That means stay where you are and um, never go anywhere with somebody private, even with a safe helper not to go into a private place. If the safe helper says, I'm going to take you into a private office, we teach the child not to go into a private office with anybody, but to stay in that public space. Um, and to, as the officer said before, you can run, scream, make a scene, to yell a lot and to, in order to get that attention. But if they cannot find an officer, what we teach them is a mother with children will often take care of you. Um, I do want to say one thing quickly, which is that when, when I go with my grandchildren, as I roll into wherever we go, the first thing I do, as soon as you get to a parking lot, you start by seeing people in t-shirts and with name tags. I immediately identify with them. What color are the shirts? What does the name tag look like? The, the, you need to start that before they get into a park or into a place. Let them know who those safe helpers are as soon as you get in. Talk to them at a plan as soon as you get in. Those are things that you can do as a parent to help develop plans. B is bring a friend. Never go any place alone. 
This is something I think children today in safer neighborhoods are not used to. But there's safety in numbers. And a buddy can be a friend or a neighbor or someone in a class or a brother or a sister. It's all okay. But it's always safer to have a buddy because a buddy can help you make decisions. A buddy, if you've gotten into trouble, can go get help. But we teach children they should never go anywhere alone. Even when they're outside, they should have someone with them and that they should always have a buddy with them. This is very important, which is the concept of check first, and that's our C rule, that before they open the door at home, they need to check first. You need to know if they're opening a door. You need to know if, they're op if you want them to answer the phone. Um, but, and if they do answer a phone, be sure that you're teaching them how to answer a phone. And if I call your house and they say, Mommy's not home, I don't want to know that. That's too much information for me. You need to teach them how to answer that phone. You need to teach them to say, my mother's not available. Or better yet, today, kids don't need to answer the phone. Let it go to the machine. Um, but you, you, you need to take a look at teaching them how to handle that. The other thing that we teach about check first is, again, never to um, accept anything from anybody that your parent has not given you permission to. Always check everything out and check any change of plan. If I'm supposed to walk home with my buddy, Shmuley, and I are supposed to walk home together, and Yankee's father stops by and says, um, I'll give you a ride home, and he lives two houses away, the, the answer is, I have to check with my mother first. You have to train your children. The answer to any change of plan is, I have to check with my parent or adult in charge first. Um, so let me just, then D is do tell, and do tell what we really focus on. And again, there's at least, and I'm sure you can all imagine, a full hour on how to work on do tell having to do with privacy and privacy of their body. But one of the things that I stress is that studies have shown the importance of children having language and being able to identify their own private parts. Um, the the um, Stewart House, which is the agency we work with who specialize in working with abused children, who have worked with um, a very uh, large number of Orthodox Jewish children have said that they have noted that the majority of our Orthodox children did not have language and didn't know how to tell parents what was going on because they didn't know how to say the parts of the body. They didn't know what to tell them. And part of the message a child gets is, if you can't tell me what it's called, you're obviously not comfortable talking about it. So you need to be able to identify parts of the body with your child so a child can talk to you about it. Um, and you have to be aware, encourage them to talk to them about, to talk with you about any concerns they have about their body, about their maturity, about behaviors of other children. If other children are doing things that are making them more uncomfortable, they need to come in to tell you. Um, and then the, the rules that we teach them is touching, looking at, or talking about private parts is never a game. Touching, seeing, or talking about private parts is never a secret. And a child can say no, even if it's to an adult, another child, or a brother or a sister. And those are really important rules that we teach the kids. Um, just going to end just with telling you that this is really our philosophy, which is that in order for us to create safety in a community, we need the schools to teach children safety and to teach their children, to teach their teachers safety and to set up safe school policies. We need the parents to take an advocacy role. Go to your schools and tell your schools you want to make sure that there is a program in your schools. Here in, uh, in Passaic and Teaneck, New Jersey, Project Sarah has the Safety Kid program. They can bring that program in. Um, but it's your job to speak with your children and to be involved. And then it's our job, or it's, it's your job to make sure that your children understand the ABCs of safety. Um, and and th that's what actually makes for a community that is safe. It takes, it takes an entire community to allow, to create safety for children. That entire community has a role when, we're, when they're not safe. <laughs>